called how did people get ice in 1850? Yeah, they have an ice house. It used to be insulated, sometimes you buried into a hill or oh you do? That's cool. You, and what do you keep in there now? Dead bodies. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, you do keep dead bodies if you keep these, yeah. And yeah, because it's it insulated. And they would have ice houses. So all summer you could have ice. You had to have a little bit of money, the White House had ice. So they made something that was actually becoming a big treat. Oh, in the 50 years before this. Ice cream. Ice cream, exactly right. Yeah. And he had ice cream with cherries. And they actually took a picture of it right before he ate it. That's a picture of what he had right before. <laughs> and something happened. He clearly had some kind of intestinal issues before. He was dyspeptic. But he got a stomach ache that evening. By the middle of the night, he was in agony. He would pass out from the pain the next day. So something happened where blockage, there was gas, and probably his stomach, his stomach exploded. Oh, oh. Yeah. And he died five days after the 4th of July. Ice cream. Yeah, I know that was the thing. It was ice cream, so don't eat ice cream. And it won't eat So. I don't have his death mask. I'm sorry. I know we're so disappointed. You said that, uh, no, no, I just I hinted at it. <laughs> this one I really don't have. But there's gonna be a new president, but who's gonna save the country? I mean, it's literally at civil war. Clay's thinking it's over. We have all these so-called compromisers and war horse, old war horses of Congress, they're near the end. Who will save the country? There's only one man. Who? Calhoun. No! See, Calhoun. No, it's not right in front of you. Wait, it can't be big. Neck hair. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Look at that ring. So, Raul C. Calhoun organized. Look at the glasses. You're trying to tell me that's fake? Yes! That's his brother. He's a little heavier. Okay, so President Fillmore, not a great president, but we're not done with Raul. <laughs> president Fillmore, he okay, he's going to be a very not very great president, but he was more open to compromise than Taylor, and so with. He opened a compromise that would allow another senator, senator to do what Clay did back with the compromise, I'm sorry, the Missouri Compromise. Remember how Clay broke it up, but he wouldn't do it for the Compromise of 1850, the omnibus bill? Stephen Douglas, a Democrat from Illinois, very intelligent, very talented politician, wants to be president. He was 5'2", five 5'3", five so they called him Little Giant. He Broke it up. This Democrat from Illinois. And he's well, he thinks he's got a way to unify the North and the South behind him. President 56 or 60. And they broke it up into three bills. So remember yesterday I gave you the five parts of the Compromise of 1850? So quick look at that. I also have the vote in the conch in the house. You don't need the vote here, but I'm showing you how they broke it up. And there's one change though. So let's look at this right here. The first two parts, okay, we already have that down from yesterday. We should have that down. These two things, except for one change. They included one bill, but do you see the change? Clay's original idea was no slavery in DC. Now no more slave markets, no more open slavery or slavery exchanges within the side of the capital. Symbolic. The vote in the House, 9785. The number is not as important as which section voted for this. North or South? California free? No slavery? That's North. The North will vote for this. So, all Northern congressmen voted for it, all Southern congressmen voted against it. And the Board of States voted against it too. Then, the middle bill, which we mentioned yesterday, Missouri, or, uh, New Mexico and Utah. But you'll notice a big difference here. 
They never used the word popular sovereignty in this one. They just said, don't write their own constitution. Because popular sovereignty, the word had become so divisive. So they will decide it. Here's the big deal down the road. So this is going to open up New Mexico and Utah territories to slavery in the short run. Since it opened up to slavery, therefore slave codes, what section voted for that? So the South and a few Northern Democrats went with them for party unity. Isn't it weird the vote was the same? Yeah. Kind of ironic, isn't it? So one law, one law, and then the last two parts would be one more law. The Fugitive Slave Law, mentioned this before, citizens, all male citizens must join in. They must join in a posse to run down runaway slaves. Basically throwing out state laws. And the Texas border issue. A few more northerners join southerners to vote for this one. So this part, one law, one law, one law. That's how they passed it. That's how they got this all done. So you notice it's not like a real compromise. It showed the sectional divide, but it was passed. And as soon as it's passed, the fighting ended. In fact, the champagne came out. They toasted themselves. They were overjoyed. No more flashing guns and knives at each other on the floor of the house. I mean, literally, they were just overjoyed. Such relief that would last about two years. They saved the union. Did they save the union? Is there still a union? So to speak, yeah. This is actually pretty complex. It did not stop civil war. Civil war happened, but they pushed it back 11 years. If the civil war would have happened that summer of 1850, the South would have won. Uh, no doubt about it. No doubt the United States would have lost. Everything we know about the United States would have been gone. And the thing was, remember those maps I showed you of the transportation revolution of railroads? And I showed you from 1850 to 1860. And there were 20,000 miles of track built in those 10 years. But almost all the tracks were in what part of the country? They were all in the north. That would be decisive for victory. And the population of the north grew, grew much faster in the 1850s. Significantly faster than the south. Yeah. So if the South had was, you think slavery still exists? It's so many what ifs, it's hard to say. It's hard to imagine they would keep that system, but it was making money. You know, making a lot of money then. And yeah, it's a big deal. It didn't save the Union, or it did save the Civil War, but by pushing it back 10 years. And the thing, 1862 and again in 1864, it was close. South almost won. So that's even after waiting 10 years. It was that close. Uh, big deal. And think about it now. Those are open to slavery. And the fugitive slave laws would be despised in the North. Despised like you can't even imagine. And one thing about Utah, this would be a big deal for them. They were terrified about coming into the Union and once it became a territory. There was a lot of worries, and so what happened in Utah, they, the territorial government gave it Salt Lake City, and they did two things to make sure that they would not have to flee. Remember I told you how they went to Los Angeles, so everything would not have to run away? And so there, the Utah Assembly, which was then the majority were people who followed Brigham Young over the last the previous 10 years, I'm going to say seven years, they would pass slave codes, and slavery would start there. Even though they were an abolitionist group, that state of the union. So slavery did come there and banned plural marriage, polygamy. It still happened, but that's what happened. That's how they were, that's how, then they didn't have to run away and the people from Los Angeles actually came there. So Utah did come, but they would have slaves for a while. Not a lot. A lot of slaves or slave owners come into this area along the Eagle River in New Mexico, and there'd be a couple really big battles during the Civil War. I mean, not like Gettysburg size. But big battles. So, 1852, the euphoria of saving the Union was still there. And this election, after three really big elections, just dramatic elections, eh, kind of boring. A dough faced Democrat, Franklin Pierce, was chosen as a compromise. 
Everybody knows what a dull face is, so I don't need to explain that. Winfield Scott, did they try one more time? The last major attempt by the Whigs to pick a general. But old fuss and feathers, not quite the same. Yes? What's a dull face? Oh, somebody actually doesn't know what a dull face is. <laughs> no, no one, no one knows. Okay. <laughs> dull face, think about red dough. What color is bread, though? White. So what it is, it's a northerner who favors southern policies. So it's a weird analogy from the 1850s, and don't blame me for the analogy. I didn't do it. So imagine a northerner with the dough on his face, so a white face, so like the white republic in the north, but you remove it, and it would be a black face for the slavery policies of the south. Yeah, I know. And it doesn't make sense because aren't the slaveholders in power in the South and they're white? But remember, Jefferson was called the Negro president because he was elected by slave power, not because he supported the whites of the blacks. So it's the same kind of weird analogy. Lewis Cass was a dull face. Pierce was a dull face. And the next president, James Buchanan, will be a dull face. So the Free Soul Party lost a lot of its steam after the Compromise of 1850. So Hale did not do as well as Van Buren did. So you have this Northerner who support the South, and Scott just didn't have it. He'd get a lot of votes, but the Whig Party is in serious trouble. And the election result would be a big victory for Franklin Pierce. A lot of votes, but both North and South, both sections went with the Democrats. But the Democratic Party, they're on the verge of breaking up in the North over free soil. And the Whigs are on the verge of literally ending over the issue of slavery in the territories. They're just about done because of the division North and South. So while the same year as this election, Harriet Beecher Stowe would write what book or publish what book? There's Uncle Tom's Cabin. Uncle Tom is a great hero in this story. And I will tell you one thing really quickly. There are these very popular shows called minstrel shows at this time. They were starting in the 1830s. And there were mostly white singers and dancers. A, a great American songwriter by, by the name of Stephen Foster would do a lot of these songs, like My Kentucky Home, things like that. But it was almost, almost all these minstrel shows were making fun of either slaves or free blacks. The whole thing was just mocking them. They would dress in blackface and make fun. They're horrifically racist, at the same time incredibly popular. And they start doing a show, Uncle Tom, Uncle Tom's Cattle. And he's this brave hero fighting for his family. He's a slave, fighting for him. And they would turn him into this joke in these minstrel shows. And then long after the war, and long after Reconstruction, so into the 20th century, it became a major insult for one Usually men, the one black person to call another one an Uncle Tom, implying that you're kind of like a cuffy. Remember the term cuffy? That was another way to call somebody a cuffy was an Uncle Tom. And I still hear that today, though. You know, <laughs> yeah, you have to get out of some places like Montana. But that's still used today, which is actually very ironic because Uncle Tom was a great hero, but it's become an insult. This book would be burned in the South, despised this horrible misrepresentation of the wonderful system of slavery, when it probably wasn't violent enough of the real system. That's Uncle Tom's cabin. Same year, we've already read next excerpt. At the same time this election, the fugitive slave laws were blowing up in the states. Northerners were furious as a major infringement on state laws, but Southerners claimed to be the group fighting for more and more state rights. And it was this weird contradiction that will go on through this entire time that still exists to this day. Because what this was is federal law was going to force state law, states, to totally obey federal law and not state law. Yet Southerners claimed they were for states' rights. So before we get to the Southern view, Remember the infringement. The first one was, it said that all white citizens, and that meant men, they will be compelled to join a posse to run down fugitives. If you don't, you go to jail. 
that's a pretty big infringement on your rights. If you say, no, I'm not going to run down a slave. I do not believe in slavery. Doesn't matter. You must do it. And this shows, this is from Boston. A lot of fugitives and free blacks lived in Boston. And what is this warning people? Yeah. First off, the police officer, the watchman, yes, police, but it's also these posses. Because if you join a posse, you're essentially like deputized, a short term deputy, uh, deputization. What are they warning? What are they warning? Run. Not just, but not just fugitives. Who else? Yeah, everybody is black. Stay away, because they're kidnapping people and sending them south. And then, yeah. Wait, what was the southern view again? We'll come back to the southern view in a second. But this is why they said it was an infringement of state rights. Well, they would go in front of the judge, and the idea was the judge then would decide, basically make a writ, an order, and whether or not they're free, a free person, or a fugitive. But to pay for the judge's time, the judge would get $5, which is a lot of money back then, $5 to find someone free, but $10 if they found them to be a slave. Now, it's supposedly because there's more paperwork involved, but what does that look like? They're rigging the system to find them to be a slave, aren't they? Now, we'd like to think the judge wouldn't do that, but they're humans like everyone else. Boy, this doesn't sound like this. they're just basically throwing out state laws. Now, Southerners more and more were saying at this time, by the Civil War, they were saying, we defend the idea of state rights. I put state rights. It should be states rights. I just realized that. I forgot an S. I'm going to put an S in there. Anybody mind? Just relax for a second. Travel. See the world. Where did it go? Watch this. This is going to. Did you see that? So, states' rights. More and more. What Southern states were saying is that they're worried about the power of the federal government potentially infringing on the rights of states to have slaves. So they're saying that slavery was a states' rights issue. So that's what they're saying. So more and more states' rights became the defense of slavery. But did they really believe in states' rights? Because they were more than willing to throw out state laws in the North to have these fugitive slave laws. States' rights was just a slogan. They didn't really care about state rights. They only cared about what? Well, money coming from slaves. slaves. They cared about slaves. So they'd be more than willing to infringe on state laws in Massachusetts to return runaway slaves. But they didn't want the federal government to tell Alabama how to have their slaves. And that was a key element. It became a code word. We stand for states' rights as long as states' rights mean slavery. Now, 20, 30 years after the Civil War, you're going to get this whole um, talk about the Civil War was really about states' rights. And it'll go back to the idea. When in reality, the whole thing was about defending slavery. And they'll come back to that. You might have heard this when people refer to the Civil War. To take the states' rights thing, in the 1880s, but especially 1890s, Southerners started referring to the Civil War as the war between the states. All of you have heard that, right? That didn't come about until about 30 years after the war. To try to say the war was a state's issue. So that was kind of part of a myth they would create afterwards. But back to this then. So state, state, states' rights is simply meant pro-slavery. This will come back again in the late 1940s. With President Harry Truman, a Democrat from Missouri, and just listen to this because we'll obviously go over this, it'll be a big deal. He would desegregate the army before the army was separate black and white units. And also talk about having real civil rights legislation in the United States. Southern Democrats broke away from the party and created their own party. And they called it the States' Rights Party. And states' rights would be brought back for synonymous with anti-civil rights, anti-equal rights. And then later anti-feminism and a few other things. So words have meaning. We'll come back to it. Well, Northern states 
furious at the fugitive slave law, would pass a series of laws called the personal liberty laws, saying you don't have to obey. And Southerners went nuts. When Northern states passed these personal liberty laws, saying you don't have to join the posse to run down slaves, Southerners thought, you're attacking us. You're attacking our very way of life. And it was like another checkoff. The Southerners were like keeping a scorecard. And you know, they, they supported Wilmot or no accession of Texas or uh, opposed to fugitive slave laws. Or they just started checking these off. And they're coming to get us. And this is another example. <clears throat> you can see a little bit like what happened with the Patriots during the late 1760s, 1770s. When they begin to look at every single thing the British did as being this part of a, like an elaborate plot, more and more you're going to see that. And not making a comparison about the values of each, but you can see that kind of almost manicness happening in the South. Well, another group's going to be created. Before we get to this, it's going to be called the filibusters. Filibusters were freebooters or soldiers of fortune or almost like mercenaries who, many times on their own initiative, started going down to Latin America. And they tried to overthrow the governments of places like, well, actually, they overthrew Nicaragua, guy named William Walker right here. And their plan was to overthrow Nicaragua, and he invaded Costa Rica, but was beaten back, and then asked to be annexed into the United States as what kind of state? Slave state. Filibusters became these just basically cutthroats and hooligans who began to try to get Latin American states. And they did try a number of places. And the Pierce administration was relatively favorable to him. Here are filibusters, and they're around Pierce's Secretary of State, James Buchanan, future president. And while in Austin, Belgium, Pierce, I'm sorry, Buchanan, for the Pierce administration, would issue the Austin Manifesto, which said the United States would encourage the taking of Cuba, potentially by filibusters. The United States had their eye on Cuba. This goes back to when Jefferson was president. How many slave states could you make out of Cuba? It's a big island with a lot of people. That could be three states. Six senators. So, Austin Manifesto. Basically just a document saying the United States is encouraging. Now this caused huge reaction in the North. It didn't happen. The US would keep its eye on Cuba. We kind of engineer a war so we can take Cuba. 1898. Spanish American War. Put a lot of dictators in there afterwards. Cuba has an interesting relationship with Cuba, which we'll get to. Walker would eventually be, there'd be another coup there, and Nicaraguans would always throw him and execute him. So that never did happen. In fact, uh, in Costa Rica, one of their most hollow ground is this. Um, Hacienda, where they beat back Walker's forces. It's like our independence in Costa Rica. Yeah. So the manifesto just said that Cuba would be like available for the United States should take. Okay. United States, and they even encouraging filibusters. So here are filibusters like threatening Buchanan's, implying that the filibusters are actually running the government. A bunch of cutthroats and hooligans. Um, see the pistol there with six barrels. This one you can fire, rotate, fire, rotate. The precursor to the revolver, Pepperpot pistol. Yes, that's a cool name, Pepperpot. And oh, one more thing. During this era, too, senators started doing an action in the United States Senate. Well, let me tell you something about the Senate. What we redo, how many senators does each state have? How many senators are there today? Two, there's total, total, not just Montana. Not great. Where are the senators from Montana? Senators from Montana? John Tester, Democrats up re elected in 2018. Who's the other senator? No. <laughs> in two years. You know, in a year, you're like, you don't know that. Now it's time. You're not in junior high, right? Rick James. Rick. Me, did I say Rick? Just Rick Hills, who. Uh, oh, yeah, Randy. Yeah. But Steve Dane, and who's our member of the house? 
great GM four days. We just lied to found out we just lied to the police. But anyways, that's another story. This is just it. Yeah, he was there. We he assaulted a reporter. Yeah, the mugshot was pretty. But that was saying, do you frown? Do you look bad? So he's got like. But back to this. Back to this. Hundred ten. So how many votes does it take to pass a law in the Senate? Yeah. How many? We don't have majority in the Senate anymore because of the weird Senate rules. It requires 61 votes to pass a law in the Senate. A super majority. And the reason why is the Senate, because this was supposed to be the upper house, they have the ability to deliberate. So they have unlimited debate. In the House of Representatives, they can they cut off debate. You have like three minutes of debate or five minutes or 15 minutes. In the Senate, the senators, especially back then, could debate as long as they wanted to. So if they want to debate a bill, they can get up to the podium and talk about anything they want for as long as they can stand there. One senator to stop the Civil Rights Act of 1957 would stand up there for 28 hours. <laughs> he read his grandmother's recipes. He uh, read the, out of the phone book. <laughs> and then as soon as they got done, another Southern senator got up. They, they debated and held up voting on it for 63 days. Now, they started doing this in the 1850s. I'm sorry, the 1850s. It almost never happened. But they would debate, and Northerners were furious at this. I mean, what a bunch of thugs, hooligans. They are nothing but filibusters. So that, that's what we got to get down. The unlimited debate in the Senate is called a filibuster after these guys. And it was meant to be a derogatory statement by the 20th century, just a filibuster. And it was a way to basically stop a bill. Because if you debate, you can't vote on it. And so the Civil Rights Act of 64, which is the really important Civil Rights Act, they, de they debated that one for 61 days. The President, Lyndon Johnson, and the Majority Leader, they waited them out, got the bill passed. The Majority Leader was from Montana, Mark Spansfield. But that's what we call the filibuster. Yeah. Is there a rule against that now? Well, what happened was eventually, like, God, you know, they could talk forever. So what they said is you can actually you can vote to stop a filibuster, but you need a supermajority. Originally 67, now 60. And filibusters were rarely used until a little bit in the 90s. Republicans used it occasionally against bills that President Clinton wanted as a Democrat. Occasionally Democrats did it against President Bush, who was a Republican. But then in 2008. President Obama was elected. And beginning in 2009, Republicans in the Senate filibustered every single bill. Every bill. They basically said, we're going to filibuster. And if you don't have 60 votes, you can't stop the filibuster. So what happens? To pass a law today in the Senate, how many votes do you need? Do you want to know why nothing gets done? There are other reasons, too. You're right now, it's, it, it's, I think partially because of the filibuster, it's so dis dysfunctional that nothing's going to get It's actually remarkable what is going on. But this is big. And it all starts right here with this from filibuster. But now they, because now Democrats are going fil to filibuster everything. Everything. So it's crazy. They've changed some of the rules. But that's where that term comes from. So let's go ahead. All right, so we got a little bit left. So let's get to one more thing. Stephen Douglas, the little giant. By the way, bad picture, isn't it? By looking up, it makes him look even smaller. And part of the thing was, it was originally to make him look bigger, but now it's like looking up to somebody. He wanted a transcontinental railroad that ran through the north, Chicago, his hometown. If he got the credit for it, he could become president. But here's the big problem Douglas has. The problem is this. This area here is unorganized. The Missouri Compromise said that all area north of this line, what line is this? Yeah, that would be free. But nobody wanted to mess with it. 
But now they needed governments there to run the railroad through. He proposed this. And what did Southerners say when he wanted to make these into free territories? No, and we will not allow a bill to pass. They will. Yeah, what we call a filibuster. Exactly. So, with that, Douglas had a decision. Do I get my railroad? Or do I throw out the Missouri Compromise? He decided to start the Civil War. Not his plan, but that's what happened. The Kansas-Nebraska Act, where they found, they threw out the Missouri Compromise. They found it unconstitutional. They created two massive territories. They're sitting on one of them. Kansas and Nebraska with popular sovereignty and opened them up to slavery. All Southerners voted for. This blew up the Whig Party. Gone. Democrats nearly blew up. This was earth shattering, this law. Throwing out the Missouri Compromise, that's like going against the, almost like a biblical law. And then popular sovereignty, opening these up now to what was the Civil War in Kansas called? Bleeding Kansas. All of a sudden, you have pro slavery people called border ruffians because so many crossed over from uh, Missouri. And anybody know what they called the free soilers who came in? There are more free soilers. Anybody know the nickname for the for the state and the University of Kansas? Jayhawkers. Yep. Yeah. All right. We'll finish this on after we talk about the documents and all that. Hey, I'm sorry you guys can be away from me for five days. I mean. It's going to be tough. What? Well, I will tell you about it. And I have really good news for all of you. This vacation is going to go like that. When you literally snap your fingers, you're going to be right back here. It's going to be like the vacation never happened. You're welcome, everybody. You are so welcome. So, we need to read the documents. And we here when I did the talk about the historical content. Yeah. So what do you guys do? Don't do all three of Okay, so I don't have And there's a map of the election. That one's fine. Where to find a photo of you? Yeah, yeah. Okay. But you can figure out, okay, you want to make sure the section of the line is kind of sort of the context of the slave states. Okay, I think I'm missing a lot of it even when I was young, but I'll have to ask you a question. Uh, we probably need a remote, I mean, a uh, for isn't Craigslist pretty much the definition of sketchy? All right. Put it on the desk and we just. Uh, I yeah, see if they can move back one. Oh my god, that is such a Oh my goodness. I'm, yeah, because you just about it. Can I do it there? That's a new one. Oh, you don't want to do it on the screen? Well, I mean, because I have my regular uh, presentation. Oh, you, and you want the presentation up at the same time? Yeah. Okay, let me write. I'm you guys. Yeah. It gets warm too. Look at that. She's beautiful. Yeah. She is beautiful. I love her. Are you going to write on this? What are you going to do? I'm just gonna let me uh let me clean this because I don't want the lines back. Okay. I know, I know. Misty. Oh, 
Oh, this is awesome. the gas to see. This stuff actually works really well. Hey, do you want it clean or not? I'd like to live. Okay. Oh, Paige's back. Skipped yesterday. Where were you? Wow, okay. Congratulations. Thanks. I know you don't want thanks, but we just do it. She just smells like thanks. Smisky. Yeah. How long? This is just my like very fun Oh my! When I was in, when I was a youth growing up, we had film strips, and that reminds me of the film strip. Did you ever have anybody use a film strip? Do you even know what I'm talking about? I was like, I was like, I was like, I like, I like, I like, I was like, I like, I like, I I I I I the old strips, the rolled up little. Oh wow! Are in the old Sorge's office. There's still like fifty of them. And they're really cool. They're actually taper and then take the beat and turn on that. You can't bake that. Automatic. All right, so we have a few presentations left. I got yours. No, it doesn't. All right, so. <laughs> we got a lot of stuff to do. Oh, we're still filming this.